I'm just appealing to Enoch to say, Jews living around the time when the Old Testament is in its final it's phase like a of contemporary, formation. When we read Enoch, we're reading the writings of somebody who's at the earliest right stages right. of. So they're way more likely to get us in touch yeah. with the original meaning of the story right. than Christians later on. Azazel, one of the watchers, had taken it upon himself to teach men how to make swords, knives, shields, and armor. Bloody conflicts and ongoing military tensions mean that countries from nearly every corner of the planet are looking to increase their arsenals. And who, as the world's largest arms exporter, is right in the middle of it all? It's the United States. Here we are. Azazel and America as we finish up this series and we're going to get more specific to understand the evil in America and the evil in all of our hearts so that we can know to preach the good news to ourselves, to this world, to this nation of what Jesus has done for us uh, by not only conquering the nations but conquering these evil powers that rule the nations and rule over our hearts so that we can have freedom in this new kingdom that we're experiencing already but not yet. So now, let's dig in and try to understand this uh, mysterious figure, Azazel. We do find him in scripture, and we have a whole video on that in our atonement series that I definitely encourage you to check out. But we're gonna have a little bit of information here about Azazel to help bring us up to speed. And then we're gonna see uh, this character through the book of Enoch and how that gives us more context into who he is. And then understanding America will open up this character even more uh, and how we can continue to prophesy and call out the evil uh, that's happening in our world so that we can see God's kingdom come here in America and on earth as in heaven. I hope you guys are excited. I hope you guys are subscribed. Get ready. We've got another incredible episode with a lot of great scholars who are going to blow your mind. Let's check it out. Leviticus 16 and verse 8, again, we're familiar with the fact that Aaron is told to pick two goats and that cast lots over the two goats. So we've got two goats, Aaron casts lots over them. One of the goats, again, if you did the reading for today, you're, this is going to be familiar. Or if you just read Leviticus 16, one lot falls on a goat and then that goat is for the Lord, for Yahweh. The Hebrew is the, I have in yellow here, the preposition Lamed plus the name Yahweh, Ladonai. The other goat is Lamed, and then another name. This goat is for Azazel. And scholars have wondered for quite some time, like what, what in the world is going on here? Azazel was, was a demon, not just in later Judaism, but he is a he is a deity, you know, to, to an Israelite mind, demonic figure of the wilderness. He's a wilderness entity, a god, a deity associated with the wilderness. He's not Yahweh. Now, here's the unique thing about this day. So after the waters, he takes from all the Israelites two goats for a purification offering and another ram for an ascension offering. So he's gonna take the two goats and present them before Yahweh at the tent of meeting, and he's gonna get out dice. Dice, <laughs> he shall cast lots, and the dice will determine the fate of these goats. One lot will assign the goat for Yahweh. The other lot will assign the goat for Azazel. <laughs> Who's this? Azazel, it's a wonderful question, John. Azazel was was a demon, not just in later Judaism, but he is a he is a deity, you know, to, to an Israelite mind, demonic figure of the wilderness. He's a wilderness entity, a god, a deity associated with the wilderness. He's not Yahweh. The wilderness is his domain. It's the bad place. It's the anti-Eden. The wilderness is not where Yahweh is. Yahweh is leading us through the wilderness 
to his land, to the land he is giving us, to the new Eden. So once a year, we're going to hit the reboot button and we're going to send all of the impurities, all the things that are anti-Eden back to anti-Eden. Because Eden, you know, the, the, the camp, the, the holy company, the holy family in God's domain needs to be purified. You know, we, we've sort of read New Testament forgiveness and sacrifice of, of Jesus terminology back into the Old Testament, and therefore we don't understand what's going on here. What we should do is understand what's going on here and then read that into New Testament material. That is, typically isn't what happens. We do the reverse, and it creates a lot of confusion. You put impurity and sin and defilement, you know, and whatever label you want to put on it, everything that is anti-Eden, you cleanse the sacred space, you, you reboot the community, and you take all that stuff that is incompatible with the presence of God, and you put it out there because that's where it belongs. Aaron will cast lots for two goats, one lot for Yahweh, the other lot, or Azazel. So the sentence structure leads you to think that each lot will designate each goat for someone. The first lot's for someone, and then the way the Hebrews phrased for Azazel puts it in a parallel slot as if it's a name or a title of some kind. Mm. And then we'll just keep reading. Then Aaron will offer the goat on which is the lot for Yahweh fell and make it a purification offering. And the goat on which the lot for Uzazel fell shall be presented alive before Yahweh to make atonement for it, to send it to Uzazel into the wilderness. So there's two ways this has been translated throughout history, two main ways. There is ample evidence that the earliest interpreters of Leviticus understood this as the name of a spiritual being. So I'm just looking here at the Hebrew Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament by Kohler and Baumgartner, and their first kind of main entry here is a demon of the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Lots of scholarly history to that. The etymology, like what's the Hebrew root for the name, is they say uncertain. However, there has been an explanation offered by a, a Semitic scholar, Nicholas Wyatt, who thinks it derives from two roots. One is the word azaz in Hebrew, which means strong. And the other one is el, which means spiritual being, powerful spiritual being. <laughs> There's azel, who resides in the wilderness. Hmm. The scapegoat interpretation, you really have to do some legwork here. This is also an ancient interpretation. I, actually, it gets really complicated and into Semitic philology nerdiness stuff. But there are some people who think it's related to an Arabic cognate word, uh, which means to remove, and that it's a shorthand, the goat for removal. I'm compelled by the parallelism multiple times that these are both names or titles for the one to whom it is sent. No part of this goat, the living goat, is offered to Yahweh. This is not a sacrifice. Hmm. It's an elimination ritual. The biblical prescription does not call for the death of this goat. It is simply sent away as a ritual garbage truck <laughs> carrying controlled toxic waste to Azazel. The reason for the lot ritual before Yahweh is that he must decide the role of the goats through what appears to be chance. Hmm. Through the lot ceremonies, the goats are designated as belonging to Yahweh and to Azazel respectively each being a party capable of ownership. The fact that Yahweh is a supernatural being could be taken to imply that Azazel is the same. But the animal is not an offering to Azazel. Rather, the live goat transports Israelite failures to Azazel, who ends up having to take this noxious load. <laughs> the ritual is an unfriendly gesture to uh. Azazel. He said, it's more like sending someone a load of chemical or nuclear waste. <laughs> yeah. Because it's Yahweh who commands the priest to perform the ritual, it appears that Azazel is his enemy. Hmm. It's likely, therefore, that Azazel is some kind of spiritual being, that his presence in the desert regions is the extreme opposite of God's holy presence in the Holy of Holies. 
However, the nature of Azazel's personality is not revealed in Leviticus, likely to avoid the danger that some might be tempted to honor him. Hmm. So this is more like, this is the snake. It's a name for the snake. Mm. If the mosaic of the messianic deliverer in the Hebrew Bible is truly a mosaic, they're a second Adam. They're like a king from the line of Judah. They're like the high priest. They're like the prophet, like Moses, right? And the Hebrew Bible gives you all these characters to create a mosaic. The same is true for the mysterious one Jesus called the evil one. Yeah. Lucifer. Uh Uh-huh. That is one name in the Latin translation tradition. The Latin tradition. But the biblical images are the slanderer, the snake. The slander is where we get Satan, right? Or is that something Um, else? The Satan, or the Satan, is the one who is opposed. The opposed. The opponent. Yeah. Okay. So Azazel, which very plausibly is a Hebrew Compound word meaning powerful spiritual being. The morning star? Yeah, is an image from Isaiah 14. So, but here it's the idea of Azazel is an image of a spiritual being, the non existent one. Mm. Hmm. I mean, the one who exists, but in a state of chaos and darkness. And so, that evil one is the architect behind why we're all outside of Eden. So, once a year, we send him a load of BS in a paper bag on fire, (laughs) right? And we send it out, like send it back where it came from. Ring the doorbell. It's the elimination ritual. It's so illuminating. The other goat represents Yahweh's desire to do away with the effects of sin and evil once and for all by sending the load of waste back to the one who brought it into the world in the first place. This is the core of the Day of Atonement. The name Azazel stirs up a lot of controversy across many texts of major religions. For one, there appears to be many variations of Azazel, from being an elusive specter that receives a scapegoat full of sin from Aaron in Leviticus 16, from which the goat was cast down from in apocryphal biblical texts. Azazel also takes the form as the personification of evil and wickedness, some saying he is a demon in the desert a demon who controls other goat demons, and even a leader of fallen angels in the Book of Enoch. As can be seen in older versions of the Bible, the phrase Azazel does not appear at all. However, if we look at more modern translations, such as Leviticus 16.8, it reads, And Aaron is to cast lots over the two goats, one lot for the Lord, and one lot for Azazel. By this, it means to show us that Azazel is another entity, one who is considered to be the polar opposite of the biblical god, possibly even an evil entity, hence why he's the one receiving the scapegoat with all the sin imbued with it. Furthermore, this translation sees Azazel mentioned again in Leviticus 16.10, where it reads, The goat which has been designated by Lot for Azazel is to be stood alive before the Lord, to make atonement on it by sending it away to Azazel in the wilderness, a symbolic representation of man casting away his past sins and delivering them to where they belong, out with Azazel. While Azazel does not make another appearance within the Bible, some rabbis have deduced that the name Azazel itself gives away a clue as to its meaning. In the Enochic literature, however, which are other Jewish religious texts that are rich with angels and demons, it tells us that Azazel was actually quite a prominent figure. He appears in the Book of Enoch, a book that details the fall of angels known as the Watchers. Before the Great Flood, the Watchers were angels that under God's instruction were to watch over mankind and see that all was well amongst humanity. However, in chapter 6 of the Book of Enoch, we are told that the children of men had multiplied and that they had beautiful daughters which were born unto the world. The angels saw these beautiful mortal women and lusted after them and decided that they wanted them as wives and wished to impregnate them with their own seed. A less detailed version of this is also described in Genesis 6, 1 through 8, where we see the Watchers described simply as the sons of God, who were the heroes of old and men of renown. Genesis does not, however, attempt to show us the relationship between the sons of God, or the Watchers, and the mortal women. It simply states that they had relations, and married those they chose to. The Book of Enoch states that the spawn between the Watchers and the mortal women 
were called the Nephilim. But in the Book of Enoch, the sons of God, the Watchers, are detailed as being malevolent as they ignore Simjaz' warning to leave the women alone and instead convince him to join in. They swear an oath that together they will take the mortal women and make them their own. A list of angels who committed this act are also detailed here, but amongst their names, Azazel does not appear yet. By chapter 8, Azazel is mentioned and singled out as being the entity who taught men to make swords, knives, shields and breastplates. He taught them the metals of the earth and how to use them, before leading them astray and corrupting their ways. It's interesting that Azazel is mentioned first and given a much longer and more aggressive subject to teach the mortals. While the others spoke about plants, the weather, astrology and the earth, Azazel is the only one noted as showing mankind the tools he might use for war and battle. He's also noted as the only angel to lead men away, despite the other angels doing the exact same thing, though the subjects of their information is far more benign than swords and knives. Given that Azazel teaches man such an intense and detrimental topic, and given the fact that he is mentioned first in this chapter, many believe that Azazel is a leader of the Watchers. In chapter 9, Archangels Michael, Uriel, Raphael and Gabriel gaze down from heaven and see the destruction being caused on earth, courtesy of the trifling of the Watchers. What's interesting is that they are quick to blame Azazel, as they tell God, Thou seest what Azazel hath done, who hath taught all unrighteousness on earth. God also tells Archangel Raphael to bind Azazel hand and foot and to cast him into the darkness and make an opening in the desert, which is in Dudael, and cast him therein, and place upon him rough and jagged rocks, and cover him with darkness, and let him abide there for ever, and cover his face, that he may not see light. And on the day of the great judgment, he shall be cast into the fire, and heal the earth, which the angels have corrupted, and proclaim the healing of the earth, that they may heal the plague, and that all the children of men may not perish, through all the secrets that the Watchers have disclosed and have taught to their sons. And the whole earth has been corrupted through the works that were taught by Azazel. To him, ascribe all sin. This information about Azazel in America is blowing my mind and I hope you are learning as much as I am. Please make sure you're subscribed, turn on the alerts, press that like button, send this out to people that you love and encourage them to share the good news for what Jesus has done for our world. Let's get back to the message. Asael, another character, taught men to make swords of iron and weapons and shields and breastplates and every instrument of war. He showed the metals of the earth how they should work gold to fashion it suitably and concerning silver to fashion it for bracelets and ornaments for women. Bloody conflicts and ongoing military tensions mean that countries from nearly every corner of the planet are looking to increase their arsenals. And who, as the world's largest arms exporter, is right in the middle of it all? It's the United States, dealing in weapons ranging from assault rifles to fighter jets and armored tanks. So who is on the receiving end? With escalating situations in Syria, Iraq, and Yemen, it may not surprise you that the U.S. sells most of its weapons to its Middle Eastern allies. Saudi Arabia was the top recipient of U.S. arms between 2011 and 2015. They have purchased everything from American-made F-15 fighter jets, M1 Abrams tanks, Apache attack helicopters, and Patriot missile batteries. The United Arab Emirates, Turkey, and many other countries are also big customers. Now, these governments are essentially being given the arms as the U.S. government contributes billions to foreign military financing. Roughly 5.7 billion is planned for 2017. Israel, Egypt, Jordan, Pakistan, and Iraq are the top recipients of this U.S. largesse. This trade is not just in the Middle East. Taiwan and South Korea are also big customers, largely in response to China and North Korea. And funding for African militaries will more than double in 2017 from 2015 levels, likely a consequence of increased terrorist activity in places like Mali, Somalia, and Nigeria. All told, the United States was responsible for 33% of worldwide weapons exports between 2011 in 2015. And it's well known that the United States of America spends more money on its military by far than any other country in the world. In fact, 
40% of all military spending around the entire world is done by the United States. It spends more money on its military than the next 10 countries combined. And it's been this way for a long time, more than 80 years. Since World War II, the United States has spent the most money on its military. Even after the Cold War ended in 1991, the United States was like, let's just keep spending a bunch of money on our military. In fact, let's spend more. On March 28th, 2022, President Joe Biden asked Congress for $813 billion in military spending. And Congress was like, what the heck? That's way too much money. We can't afford that. What about inflation? Nah, just kidding. Congress not only approved $813 billion in military spending, but it also gave President Biden an additional $45 billion for military spending that he didn't even ask for. To put that in perspective, $45 billion is more than double the amount of money needed to end homelessness in the United States. And that's because military spending is one of the few things that tends to be bipartisan, meaning both Republicans and Democrats in Congress generally are cool with this massive spending. Despite one recent poll showing that 35% of Americans think the United States spends too much on its military. So why does the United States spend so much on its military? Others argue that a huge American military budget is necessary to, quote, spread democracy or, quote, defeat authoritarianism around the world. Notice how I put those in quotes, since the American government in reality is often preserving authoritarianism and hurting democracy around the world through its military actions. There's another, more nefarious reason why the United States spends so much gosh darn money on its military, and that's the military-industrial complex. The military-industrial complex describes how a military, government, and the defense industry all work together since they all benefit from each other. It's often represented by this iron triangle. So here's the military-industrial complex iron triangle thingy, at least in the United States. Up here, representing the legislative branch, is the United States Congress, who provides the funding for military spending in the country. Down here, representing the executive branch, is the Department of Defense, made up of the military itself and the part of the Iron Triangle that actually gets the money to spend. Over here, representing the special interest groups or industries part, is the defense industry, the military contractors, the corporations like Lockheed Martin and Boeing that produce weapons. The lawmakers are incentivized by campaign contributions from the defense industry. In the United States, lawmakers spending more money on the military usually means they'll have an easier time getting reelected. The military is incentivized, obviously, to get more money for itself, but also for political support. Many lawmakers and members of the military also get jobs in the defense industry after they retire, and vice versa. Lobbyists from the defense industry often find themselves becoming lawmakers. In politics, this phenomenon is often called the revolving door. It was in the United States, after all, that the term military-industrial complex first became widely used after President Dwight Eisenhower popularized it in his farewell address on January 17, 1961. Good evening, my fellow Americans. Our military organization today bears little relation to that known of any of my predecessors in peacetime or indeed by the fighting men of World War II or Korea. Until the latest of our world conflict, the United States had no armaments industry. American makers of plowshares could, with time and as required, make swords as well. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. Now this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development. 
yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. While the military-industrial complex arguably helps national security, it also threatens it. You see, the more weapons produced, the more weapons are out there. And the more weapons that are out there, the more weapons are used. And the more weapons are used, the more people are killed. The military-industrial complex increases the incentives for war. As long as people are going to be profiting from war, war will continue to happen. And the military-industrial complex ensures people continue to profit greatly from war. If you pay attention closely, you'll find that these corporations that produce weapons are often the biggest cheerleaders of war. So where do we go from here? We non-violently resist as we hope and we wait for our king. But we are here to not only expose these evil supernatural powers, but to declare to them and to the rest of the world that we have victory in Jesus and that he's now king and that God is using his church in the most unlikely of ways through the least of these to help as we help through the poor, as we pour our lives into connection with community with each other, uh, God will move and inspire us. Interesting because in today's world, we assume with modern Western democracy that what really matters is that somebody gets voted for and therefore they have a mandate to do what they think they should do. In the early years of Christianity, when there was no question about democracy in the ancient Roman world, at least not as far as most people were concerned, Roman citizens would vote, but most of the Christians didn't have that kind of power at all, um, they didn't mind very much how people got into power. They did mind very much what people did when, once they were in power. And that goes back to ancient Greece as well, um, where you know, rulers would regularly be put on trial after their term of office, almost as a routine thing. Wouldn't that be nice? Um, so that we could just um, ha hold them to account. Now, here's the thing. The Jewish, ancient Jewish and early Christian vision was never, we should take power and then we will do X, Y, and Z. It was rather... Uh, our task as worshippers of the true God is to hold up a mirror to those in power, to speak the truth to those in power, to hold them to account. Now, what's happened in our modern world is that the media has taken over that role, sometimes quite explicitly, um, usurping the church out of the way to say, we are the ones who hold the politicians to account because they don't seem to be very good at holding one another to account. And, okay, I'd rather somebody was doing it than nobody. But that's actually... Um, part of the central core task of the church in the New Testament is to speak the truth to power. You can see Jesus doing it to Pontius Pilate at the end of John's Gospel. Um, and so the political vision isn't so much here's a set of policies which should be put in place. It's rather here's a set of things which are things we should hold governments to account over. And one of them is to do with the poor and another is to do with health so that this doesn't necessarily mean that the British welfare state is the, the best of all possible welfare states. It certainly isn't. But that something like a total community care for the poor and care for those in need, I think is absolutely basic. Very interesting, in the New Testament, already in one of the earliest documents of the Christian church in the letters to the Thessalonians, written within 25 years of Jesus' death, Paul is having to warn people in church leadership about the danger of freeloaders, of people who realize that they can get a free lunch out of the church um, so they won't need to work anymore because the church is a sort of welfare system. And Paul says, no, it's got to be clear, um, no work, no food, um, that you've got to, um, so the church 
In other words, the church from the very beginning was a kind of what we would call a welfare system, particularly for the poor and the, and, and the, and the very needy, um, to the extent that already in the first generation that was in danger of being abused. People often say today that welfare systems are bad because they can be abused, and the answer is yes, they can, and you have to be savvy about making sure that doesn't happen. But so that uh, I, I'm not saying that the British system is right, it's got a lot of creaky bits and silly bits and bits that don't work or work in the wrong way, but I am saying that part of what the church ought to be reminding governments to do constantly is to care about those who have no means of caring for themselves. How you guys doing? Are you with me? The Bible doesn't offer a divine endorsement for any kind of political form of organized government. It, it, it gives a very thorough exploration of what political power is, but it doesn't endorse any particular form of government. My true identity is first and foremost as an image-bearing human and as a child of God in the multi-ethnic international family of Jesus. It's my primary identity markers. I might find myself in this family, I might find myself in this ethnic, I might find ethnic group, and I might find myself in this social economic group or in this nation. Those aren't the primary definers of my identity. I'm an image-bearing human. I'm a child of God in the family of Jesus. If I'm a follower of Jesus, my ultimate loyalty is to the risen King Jesus. And he's the Lord of all nations. He formed a political body called the church. It's a group of people who commit to each other to live in a common life together according to the terms of the upside-down manifesto of the kingdom. And the primary ethic of that kingdom is love and to seek the well-being of others above my own. This is crucially important. It's this non-violent, resistant, prophetic critique. And you see it right. It's what the Gospels are. <laughs> the story of the Gospel about Jesus is non-violent, prophetic critique of the rulers in Jesus' day in Jerusalem, of the, of the temple establishment. And when those authority structures demand loyalty that compromises allegiance to Jesus, God's people are to humbly disobey. It's the famous line that Peter says in Acts. We obeyed the king who's your king rather than you in this moment. And so what, if you are going to kill me, then kill me. And this is the pattern that we see all throughout the political theology of, of the New Testament and the Old Testament. You know, at the end of the day, when we talk about the powers of darkness, the one thing, though, that I hope you take away is structurally the way scripture presents this to us in the, in, in the instance of three rebellions and more importantly, how Jesus and what he does on the cross is specifically aimed at curing and reversing all three. The stuff we've talked about here, these are not accidents of scripture. These are not things that you more or less have to you know, make up, these correlations. The correlations are there, they are in the text, the language in the New Testament connects to the language of the Old Testament. This is intentional, it's strategic, it's intelligent. Okay, and so if you have one takeaway, it's to think about what Jesus did in response to not only the problem of our you know, mortality, eternal life, but just how wonderfully and how sort of in an all-encompassing way what Jesus does in the New Testament and how it's talked about covers the gamut of all of these forces of supernatural darkness and what they're about. Not one of them gets missed and nothing gets unaddressed. Up until this point, this being, this entity, Satan, has owned everyone and everything. But I'm here to tell you that if you are a member of the kingdom of God, this being, Satan, has no claim on you at all. It's as though the prosecutor has been thrown out of court. God doesn't need to hear what you've done. He doesn't need to hear why you deserve death. He doesn't need to hear that death is your destiny. If you embrace me as Messiah and you join the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, problem solved. He has no claim on you at all. And so this, my ministry, my message, is the beginning of him losing ownership of the world. This is where it begins. 
What spiritual warfare is, is the growth of the kingdom of God, the Great Commission, and the diminishing of the other kingdom. And the way that's accomplished is telling truth. You speak truth to lies. Thank you guys so much for watching. This concludes our series on the book of Enoch, Azazel, and America. I've learned so much and I hope you have too. But we're just scratching the surface and we're just getting started here at Ring Them Bells. It's been my goal for this series to help expose the division that we all find ourselves here in the political season of America. To understand that there's no more left and that there's no more right. That Jesus has defeated all of that and that we all bow humbly under one King. Uh, I want this to eliminate division and help to bring unity here in the church in America and across the globe. As we declare the victory that we have in Jesus, as we declare that he is Lord and King of the entire world, uh, we are in this already but not yet kingdom. And I know there's suffering and so much uh, sorrow that we see across this world with war, but we can non-violently protest with hope with prayer, with connection with each other, with looking out for the least of these, for the poor and the afflicted. Um, and we can do this together uh, in the power of the Spirit. Father, thank you for the truth that we have found in your word, for the victory that we have in your Son. I pray for everyone that hears this, that they can have hope uh, in, in the time of distress and the time of worry. They can know that ultimately they have victory in you and victory in Jesus. Help us to boldly proclaim this word to the nations. Help us to rest and wait uh, as you send your son back into this world. Um, give us hope. Give us the, the unity that we desire, Father, because it only comes through you. Bless this channel. Bless everyone listening. Thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. To all the peoples of the world, I once more give expression to America's prayerful and continuing aspiration. We pray that peoples of all faiths, all races, all nations may have their great human needs satisfied that those now denied opportunity shall come to enjoy it to the full, that all who yearn for freedom may experience its few spiritual blessings, that all who are insensitive to the needs of others will learn charity, and that the sources, scourges of poverty, disease, and ignorance will be made disappear from the earth, and that in the goodness of time, all peoples will come to live together in a peace guaranteed by the binding force of mutual respect and love.